Today's video is brought to you by Casetify. Go to casetify.com slash Kendall to get 15% off. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. Happy to have you all joining me today for another video. Today I'm gonna to be talking about an ongoing case. And I know some people find those videos kind of frustrating. I do too. Trust me, we all want the answers as fast as possible these days. But with this case, an arrest was just made recently and there is a lot of unknowns and a lot of questions that we just don't have the answers to at this point. But as time goes on, things will start slowly coming out. And if you're watching this in the future, you know, there might be new updates at that point. This is a Colorado case. I live in Colorado, if you didn't know that. I'm very proud of my state. And I have been following it, you know, just on social media and my local news for the last year. There's finally enough information to put together a video and it's pretty shocking how all of this ended up. This case has had quite a bit of media attention and a lot of interest online. So there have been a lot of rumors. There have been a lot of speculation, some of it, correct. So I'm just going to try to break it down as simply as I can, not get too speculative, stick to the facts, what we know at this point, and let you guys make your own minds up. Also, I just wanted to say sorry that my uploads were a bit sparse this month. I've just been going through some shit. I know you guys get it, and I needed a little time to heal and to take care of my mental health. And yeah, I'm doing a lot better now. But let's go ahead and jump into the case. Today we are talking about Suzanne Morphew. So Suzanne was born Suzanne Renee Mormon on April 30th, 1971, the day of her sister Melinda's 15th birthday. And Melinda said that she always thought of her baby sister as a birthday gift to her. She also grew up with two brothers, David and Andrew, and they were a really close family. Growing up, Suzanne was adored by her friends and family. People describe her as considerate and thoughtful, even at a very young age. When she got older, she took on after her mother. She was a very sophisticated and intelligent woman. She had a really good voice and she sang in the choir when she was in high school and singing was something that brought her a lot of joy. Suzanne's family describes her as beautiful inside and out. They said that she had a really calming presence and you couldn't help but feel safe when you were around her. She was a genuine, kind person and people said that she never had anything negative to say about anybody. In 1988, Suzanne met the love of her life. His name was Barry. Barry Lee Morphew. He was from a wealthy Christian family and his faith was really important to him and Suzanne's faith was important to her, so they were a perfect match. They fell in love almost instantly and they got married on August 6th, 1994 at Grace Baptist Church in Anderson, Indiana. Suzanne had gotten her degree in education from Purdue University and she worked as a teacher for four years after she first got married. And Barry had hopes of becoming a professional baseball player. He was actually recruited out of high school by the Toronto Blue Jays, but he got injured and that cut his professional baseball career short. So instead, he also went to Purdue University and he got his education in horticulture production. He started his company, BLM Landscaping, in Arcadia back in Indiana in 2004. His company did traditional landscaping, hardscaping as well. They also built like little sunrooms and off rooms. They also had two daughters who are named Mallory and Macy. And Suzanne was a really good mom. She adored being a mom. She wanted kids for a really long time and her girls loved her and loved Barry. Barry was a good husband and father. He was hardworking and disciplined. One thing that he really loved was big game hunting and he would often take these retreats for weeks at a time, leave his family because he needed to recharge. So then in 2014, Suzanne started a nonprofit. It was called the Suzanne R. Morphew Hope Foundation. And the mission was to address needs of children in various global locations by showing the love of Jesus Christ in tangible ways to address recognized needs. In 2018, they decided it was time for a change, so they moved. That May, they put their house up for sale, which also had 13 acres of land, and they listed it for $895,000. Then in April, they bought their house in Salida, Colorado, which was $1.6 million is a beautiful house with a gorgeous view of the mountains. It is really pretty down in Salida. This house was built in 2008 and it was on over seven acres of land. It's right on the border of the San Isabel National Forest, which is 
gorgeous. So Salida is in Chafee County. It's a very small town, just over 5,000 people, and this is known as the heart of the Rockies. Now, despite the distance between houses in this county, most people are pretty tight knit in this community. Most people in the town know each other, most residents, and they look out for one another. And the Morphe's neighborhood is considered to be a very safe neighborhood. So safe that people normally don't even lock their doors there. And as soon as they moved in, the family really thrived in their new home. The girls adjusted really well, they met friends quickly, and they loved their new home. I mean, who wouldn't? That's a gorgeous house. They started making a lot of friends and connections in the area right away and it wasn't long before they were real well-respected members of the community. And they were also very involved in their new church, which is called Grace Church in Salida. Suzanne spent a lot of her time volunteering at the church. She would make lunches for the youth group, help in any way she could. And Barry signed up to be a volunteer firefighter in the area while also continuing his landscaping company. Suzanne really prioritized staying in touch with all of her old friends, but she also made a ton of new friends in Salida. She made friends anywhere she went. She was a very friendly person. And soon she had a new circle of friends in Colorado. And another really interesting and respectable thing about Suzanne is that she was a cancer survivor. She actually had Hodgkin's lymphoma twice, once before she had her kids and then once right before they moved to Colorado. Her last treatment was October 1st, 2019. Her family had a big celebration for her. They were really proud of her for making it through it. It was difficult for her, of course, but she remained really positive throughout it. She made friends through her cancer treatments and people that did treatments with her said that she was always cheerful and positive during them. No matter what Suzanne was going through, she seemed to really keep a positive outlook. At least one or sometimes both of her daughters would go to her treatments with her every time. They were really, really close with their mom, but Barry, didn't go very often. And when he did, he kind of seemed out of place. He would kind of shut down and not really talk to anyone. Now, of course, it is understandable for something like that to be traumatizing on a partner too. But other survivors who were there said that he just seemed really uncomfortable being there. But Suzanne made it through and she had scheduled maintenance appointments throughout 2020, which brings us to May of 2020. Her next appointment was supposed to be the Monday after Mother's Day. Now, of course, where they lived was absolutely gorgeous and they had tons of trails accessible to them just from their house. And so Suzanne loved to go for an early morning bike ride every Sunday morning. It was kind of her thing. Then after she got home, they would all get ready and they would go to church together and sometimes go out to lunch, you know, spend the day as a family. And so Barry tried his best not to work on Sundays so that he could give the day to his faith and his family. But for Mother's Day that year, which was May 10th, 2020, they decided to do something different. Macy and Mallory were planning to go on a camping trip that weekend together, but they were planning to return home early on Sunday so that they could spend the day with their mother. And surprisingly, even though it was Mother's Day, since the girls were gonna be home on Sunday with Suzanne, Barry decided he was going to drive to Denver to do some work. And driving from Salida to Denver is anywhere from about two and a half to three hours. So it was a full day thing. Later on, the girls realized that they were gonna be coming home a lot later than they thought. So they texted their mother, just a short message saying happy Mother's Day, but then they didn't hear back. And they actually got worried, so they contacted a neighbor and had her go over and try to check on Suzanne. When the neighbor went over there, they saw Suzanne's car, but no one answered the door. So they all assumed she was on a bike ride, but hours went by. There was no way that she was still biking. It was pretty hot that day too. So Suzanne was officially reported missing at 5.46 PM. So the sheriff's office organized a search right away. They got the Chafee County search and rescue team involved. They also had eight tracking dogs from the Department of Corrections and several drones as well. And they began searching the area immediately after she was reported missing. More than a hundred people were brought in to search for Suzanne. And people were frantic because of course, as the sun is setting, there's a big concern that if she's out there and she's injured somewhere, that something could happen to her. And of course, with any disappearance, time is of the essence. And they ended up having a professional only search. They didn't involve the public. 
possibly because of COVID. And they also blocked off the road to the family's home so they could search that area as well. And at the time they believed that Suzanne would be in the area around County Road 225 and West Highway 50 in Maysville. And they searched as long as they could. And by the next morning, they had searched pretty much the whole area. So they brought in even more professionals, even more search teams and looked in some more tricky places, you know, like steep drop-offs, areas along rushing water. And keep in mind, they have to look out for wildlife in the area as well. There are a lot of mountain lions here. But even with all these professional searches being done, there was not a single trace of Suzanne found. Later that day, the sheriff sent out a press release asking anyone in the area with information about Suzanne Morphew to call the tip line. But what really frustrated people is there was no mention of what she was wearing that day or the make and model of her bike. Literally nothing useful other than call us if you have information. But after they reached out to the community, over 600 tips were called in. And at that point, the FBI and the Colorado Bureau of Investigation also joined in and started going through the tips and possible leads. Now you might be wondering what's Barry doing during all of this? Well, when Suzanne first went missing, Barry was 150 miles away. He was in Broomfield, Colorado, which is past Denver. So when he heard that she was reported missing, he rushed home and was home by nine o'clock PM that Sunday. Now Barry tells a few different versions of why he was out of town that weekend. The first was that he had a volunteer firefighter training thing, but then the county fire chief said that there was no training that weekend, that yes, Barry was a volunteer firefighter, but nothing was scheduled. In fact, they weren't doing trainings at the time because of the pandemic. So then Barry ends up telling investigators that he was actually out of town to set up a job site for his business. He was getting it done over the weekend because the job was supposed to start on Monday. Family members confirmed that Barry did have to work in Denver and that he had cleared it with Suzanne before he left. And again, he said he was comfortable leaving on Mother's Day because his daughters were supposed to be coming back early in the day to spend the day with their mom. So all of them, Barry and the girls, were asked to stay out of the home while they searched it, of course. Now, often this doesn't take too long, but in this case, it took a long time. They weren't able to return until the end of May. And keep in mind, she disappeared or was reported missing on the 10th. Investigators also took Barry's cell phone and his vehicle so that they could search that thoroughly as well. And while the house was being searched, Barry stayed with a friend. And this friend claims that while Barry was staying with him, he was pacing around the house nervously, looking out the windows, which is understandable considering his wife is missing. But he said that his behavior was a bit odd and that he would go on these long drives. And when he was on these drives, he said he was trying to spot vehicles that he thought could have possibly picked up Suzanne, vehicles that he claimed he remembered seeing around their neighborhood, around their house, before Suzanne went missing. And from the beginning of the case, the police have really kept things as on the DL as they can while still trying to keep the public informed enough to get leads. So it's kind of hard to know the exact details of this case at this point, but we do know that they took bags of evidence from the Morphew home. They also asked neighbors to give them any surveillance footage they had, any ring doorbell footage, and they asked for it from the dates of May 8th to May 12th. And a lot of people were quite frustrated with this because they just trusted people to give that footage up instead of going and obtaining it themselves. Now, like I said, there are a lot of mountain lions in this area, but investigators were able to rule out the idea of a mountain lion attacking Suzanne pretty early on. But at first, Barry was very set on the idea that a mountain lion could have attacked Suzanne or even have taken her. One officer has stated that, Barry stated, that he believed a mountain lion took her off into the forest and like stashed her somewhere to eat her later. And that was his explanation for why there was no trace of blood. I mean, with any wildlife attack, normally you find clothing, a shoe, some blood, some hair, something. You know, it's not gonna just be a clean scene. And this officer said that that was one of the moments that he felt like there was more that Barry wasn't sharing. Cause that was odd for him to keep pushing this idea when it really didn't make a lot of sense. And Barry is a guy who spends a lot of time outside in the wilderness, in Salida. And he also knows a lot about hunting and 
wildlife in general. So come on, it seems like he would be able to rule this out himself pretty quickly, but he really stuck with that theory for a while. Her brother also says that at one point they were looking over this area, Barry was kind of pointing down saying, you know, I think maybe she was like dragged down here by a mountain lion and taken off. And her brother said that at that point he really started to question Barry because he just knew that made no sense that there would be a blood trail. But the whole mountain lion theory was put to rest pretty early on. It just makes no sense. And at that point, Barry started to push the idea that maybe she was kidnapped and he started looking at vehicles and stuff like that. So after they spent time questioning family, friends, neighbors, other witnesses, they came to the conclusion that the last time anyone had spoken with Suzanne was on May 9th, Saturday. As far as what's reported right now, there was no witness of her on her bike the following morning. So they felt like they hit a dead end. So they needed to look more into Barry, his behavior, was weirding them out. I'm sure there is even more that we don't know about yet. They were kind of looking at him behind the scenes the whole time and not really feeding much to the public. There was silence for a while. But they decided to collect surveillance footage from the businesses around the Holiday Inn Express where Barry had stayed in Broomfield that weekend. And before Barry rushed home that Sunday, he had asked a worker of his, Jeff Puckett, to come and take over for him. And according to Jeff, when he arrived at the Holiday Inn, he went up to his room and he noticed that it smelled like chlorine. And this is the room that Barry had been staying in. The entire room smelled strongly of chlorine and there were towels all over the place. And the bed, I guess was made, but it didn't look like it was made by the hotel staff. It looked like someone had possibly slept in it or gotten into it or at least messed it up and then kind of remade it. So they check with the hotel and they confirm that they don't use chlorine to clean the hotel rooms. And also the pool was closed at the time due to COVID, even though Barry tried to say that the chlorine smell could be from the pool. And then Jeff also found a pile of mail, including a letter about property insurance and he ended up handing all of this over to the FBI. Now, obviously investigators are really starting to look at Barry. It seems like he may have had some involvement, but Barry's friends and family all really rallied around him at this time and continued to talk super highly of him. I mean, a lot of people that they interviewed, people in the town, people he worked with just said he was this upstanding guy. He, There's no way he did anything. One of his childhood friends got on the media and said that Barry was absolutely devastated by the loss of his wife and there was just no way he had any involvement. He said everyone got along in their family so well. They were the perfect family. So backtracking a little bit, within the first few days of her disappearance, Barry offered a $100,000 reward and then a friend matched it and so it was $200,000 total. Then it came out that on May 12th, Barry had given a very weird note to a local storage manager. And the note said, baby blue bike helmet, biker's clothing. No phone number, no name, nothing about her hair color. Now, Barry tries to say that at first his story of where he was was inconsistent because he was so shocked about what happened to his wife, he was confused, which is understandable in that situation, of course. And then a week after Suzanne first went missing, Barry posted this video to Facebook and it is, I don't know, gives me a very eerie feeling. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you, we miss you, your girls need you. No questions asked, however much they want, I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you, and I want you back so bad. It seems like Barry was trying to make this pre-recorded statement pull on people's heartstrings a little bit. And that way he could also avoid talking to the media and doing interviews. He can just point to his Facebook page. If you want to know what I have to say, go to my video. It gives him control of the situation. Just days before that video clip was recorded, they had actually found Suzanne's bike, which of course it's very unusual that they missed it the first time. It was close to her home off of County Road 225 
down this hill, kind of at the bottom. Investigators spent a lot of time searching in this area. And this YouTuber named Tyson Drapper, who I believe lives in the area, started recording the area. So here's some of his footage. You can see the bridge and the road leading to her house. You can see the hill and the area where the bike was found. And according to the sheriff's office, the bike was not damaged and they thought it was really strange that when they brought dogs to that area, they didn't pick up her scent at all. So that led them to believe that the bike was actually thrown there by someone who was not Suzanne and it was made to look like an accident. And the investigators also said that they found this personal item of Suzanne's, they won't say what it is, literally they claim they haven't even told her family what it is, but they found it on the road going west. We've run foot searches using air support, canine support, swift water support, and we've also utilized countless hours of drone searches. We've used well over 200 personnel and over 2,000 man hours have gone into the search, but unfortunately we haven't found Suzanne yet, and as I stated before, that is our top priority. Uh, yesterday afternoon, which is Thursday, in the area of County Road 225 and Highway 50, we did find items that we believe were personal items of Suzanne Morphew, and that uh, launched a bigger search we uh, had today, which included the full closure of US Highway 50 on Monarch Pass. In that search we used uh, today, well over 90 searchers that are well-trained individuals from both our local agencies as well as the FBI and CBI. We searched uh, over two and a half miles using grid patterns. Unfortunately, we found no other items in that area at this time. We'll, we're in the process right now of reevaluating where we are with the information we received. And I wanna, I wanna let everybody know that we are receiving information. And so we're constantly reevaluating that information. And based on that, it'll determine what our actions are tomorrow searching. However, I wanna remind everybody that while we're doing this, the investigation continues. Now what's crazy is that YouTuber I mentioned, Tyson Drapper, was searching in the area for Suzanne and filming when he actually ran into Barry. And he ended up starting a recording on his phone and putting it in his pocket. So he had record of his whole exchange with Barry. And in the recording, Barry talks about how emotional the search has been for him, how exhausting it had been for him because it covered a 200 mile radius. So we've searched a 200 mile radius. What, really? All of the mountains have been covered so far, but obviously we're gonna miss things. He said during the search, an officer had seen a mountain lion and they had thought that maybe she was dragged away. Um, the first night there was a mountain lion, the officer seen it walk by the car. So we thought maybe she got attacked by a lion. We thought maybe she wrecked coming down this hill, a car coming around the corner fast, or maybe was disoriented and got in the river. We've covered it. He pointed out all the areas that they searched and where they found her bike. And then he told him that his private investigators believe that she may have been abducted from the bridge. And he also said that when the bike was found, it was found in a ditch with the wheels facing up. He said it looked like it had tumbled down the hill and that the front wheel was mangled but the police said that it wasn't damaged. And then he proposes the theory that Suzanne had fallen off the bike, hit her head, gotten disoriented, wandered further into the woods, and then eventually got swept up by the creek. Barry also said he was upset with how the bike was handled. He thought that the officer should have left it alone until it was processed as evidence. To him, he thought that maybe Suzanne's abductor's DNA would be on the bike somewhere. And according to him, up to 10 other people had touched the bike. He was also angry that there were search teams being allowed to just walk in the area and vehicles being brought in, which he felt like could cover up any potential footprints. So in the recording, Tyson asks how he can help. And Barry said that if he's a hiker, he can continue to just search the area. And if he finds any evidence, he emphasized not to touch it. But then things kind of took a turn and Barry kind of makes a threat to Tyson. He made a little threat there at the end. I don't know if the camera picked it up or not, but he said, if I'm with the news media, he's gonna come after me. So that definitely ended very strangely. So Suzanne's nephew, Trevor Noel, actually was the one who confirmed to the media that her bike had been found. He also lived in Colorado and he sort of became the unofficial spokesperson for the family to the media. He helped organize a GoFundMe to raise money for additional searches and help the family members pay for travel, food, and housing. This GoFundMe was created 
reported on May 13th, 2020, three days after Suzanne was reported missing. The campaign raised over $33,000 from over 341 donors before it stopped accepting donations. Every morning, early we've been gathering and creating a game plan and we just sent a bunch of teams out. We have our biggest crew yet today going out again. Um, and we're working all day from when the sun comes up until the sun comes down, scouring every hill, every creek, every watershed, looking for our beloved family member and my aunt, Suzanne. I know it must be really difficult. Is there, is there any clue as to what might happen? Are there any theories that you're working on? Yes, there are, but um, I think it's best for the investigation and for the family and for the progress that we, that we uh, keep it close um, and maybe not discuss it live right now, but we're making progress and we are so far from giving up. So for weeks and months after Suzanne first went missing, the public continued to search for her hike around and see if they could find her. People would put signs all around, you know, at trailheads, anywhere where they might catch someone's eye. Neighbors and friends put up these teal and yellow ribbons along the road that led to the family's property. So then towards the end of the month, a woman named Mary Branson came forward with new information. She said the property next door to hers was under construction with plans for a 5,000 square foot home to be built there. And guess whose crew had been hired to work this spot? Barry's. And this woman, Mary, claims that shortly before Suzanne went missing, she heard the sound of construction happening in the middle of the night. The middle of the night over Mother's Day weekend. She claims that she heard what she first thought was just a truck backing up or something because it was the middle of the night. But then she realized it was the sound of construction equipment coming from the work site. Now, Mary is hard of hearing, so she knows that if she can hear it, it must be really, really loud. She said she laid there awake for a half hour listening to the noises just confused and annoyed that this was happening in the middle of the night. And later on, she went up to the crew and asked them if it was possible if they left their keys behind and maybe some teenager came in the middle of the night and was like messing with their stuff, but they said no. They said they do leave their keys there, but they're always really well hidden. So this was unlikely. And then we find out that that weekend, the crew had laid dirt and also put down concrete. Any case with concrete in it just scares me. So with this new information, investigators planned an immediate search of this area, obviously. They used equipment to check for disturbances within the concrete and they tore like half of it out. They searched the garage on the property and the entire surrounding area and found nothing. As far as we know, they may have found something, but they said that they did not find Suzanne. So then on June 1st, 2020, about three weeks after Suzanne had first gone missing, Barry filed for legal guardianship of his wife. And this request was apparently related to some real estate that he was trying to sell. So she was listed as an incapacitated adult in the Indiana court system. And once that was approved, Barry was able to sell any properties that they owned together without Suzanne being present. And then in October, 2020, the family's home in Salida was put up for sale and it sold this past March, 21. So by August of 2020, the public is definitely very suspicious about Barry. There were a lot of rumors online at this point and a lot of things being said. And even some of Suzanne's family members were starting to think that Barry really could have been involved. Barry had allegedly refused to take polygraphs on two different occasions. He disputes this. And there were a lot of rumors starting to go around about how Barry had another side to him and how he had a really bad temper that could just come out of nowhere. And his employees started saying that he was difficult to work for. And there was even a rumor going around that he may have had a mistress. Barry ended up responding to all of this by talking to the media for the first time. He ended up giving an exclusive interview to Fox 2, a local station, and it was over 25 minutes long, but he asked them not to air the recording of the interview for whatever reason. During the interview, he talks a lot about his family's deep faith and their trust in God. He's quoted as saying, Suzanne trusted the Lord, and if one person got saved from this, she would think it was worth it, which I don't really understand what that means. Then he also said, we don't know why God does what he does, 
but we have to trust him. Barry explained how he stayed out of the media because they were casting a negative light onto him. And he also criticized how the sheriff's department had handled the case. He said that they made mistakes from the very beginning and were now trying to pin the crime on him. So you can tell he's freaking out. He also talks about how a friend was with him when he found the bicycle and how the police just destroyed the evidence right in front of him. And Barry had three main theories for what he thought happened to Suzanne. One, a wild animal attack. I don't know why he was still hung up on that because it was pretty much debunked. But two, she could have been the victim of a hit and run, which also doesn't make a lot of sense. And three, she was abducted. He also implied that maybe this person who kidnapped her could have been someone that she knew, someone who could have just ran into her while she was out on her bike ride and took advantage of the opportunity. He also vowed to continue searching for Suzanne every day for the rest of his life. He also said that he was never asked to take a polygraph test. He doesn't know where that rumor came from. And he says he has cooperated with the police and that he's done over 30 hours of interviews. On July 9th, investigators did a second search of the Morphew home. It has not been released what they were looking for, if anything specific, and they have not released any information about anything that they found. And people have been very frustrated with the lack of information being put out to the public in this case because it is leading people to speculate quite a bit. At that point, pretty much all the details of the case were being kept from the public. People started commenting on the Chaffee County Sheriff's Department website, their Facebook page, saying that they were sending in credible tips that were being ignored and they were just frustrated that they weren't putting information out that it could possibly help. Now, during all this time, police are working on the case behind closed doors. They told their family that they are working around the clock trying to figure out what happened, but they weren't able to release information for whatever reason. Maybe this will all make sense one day, but in the meantime, rumors are flying online. And one rumor started about Suzanne's nephew, Trevor Noel, who became like the spokesperson. He did the GoFundMe. There were claims that he had actually tried to hit on his aunt and that she rejected him. And people also started saying that he set up the GoFundMe for his own financial gain. And then it got even crazier. People started speculating that he helped hide Suzanne's body, that he could have been involved in her disappearance. So obviously there was no information to back any of this up and it was really intense for their family. There were a lot of reports going around about Barry being seen at a local dumpster and that maybe he threw her body into the dumpster. There was also theories about Suzanne being held hostage at a neighbor's house. Another one that her body had been put through a wood chipper and put into the Arkansas River. And there were even rumors that she was buried and put into their family garden. So I can't imagine how her daughters are feeling at this point. I'm sure they are totally overwhelmed and don't know what to think. None of it has been verified. All of that is local gossip. But of course, this is what happens when people are passionate about a case and really wanna know what happened and there's no information being given. People start to just make things up. So then in September of 2020, Suzanne's brother, Andrew, who lived in Indiana, came out to Colorado to organize organize a search with hundreds of volunteers. And he raised $18,000 to search this property, this plot of land near Poncha Springs that was owned by Barry. There were some media reports that a dog had picked up her scent in a wooded area about 15 miles from the Morphew home at this plot of land that he owned. And Barry did not participate in the search but he did allow them to access it. And her brother by this point, Andrew, started saying that he believed that Suzanne was murdered and that her body was somewhere near her home. So he recruited volunteers to dig up possible grave sites. They even investigated bodies of water with sonar equipment. They brought in monitor drones and then they also searched the area with dogs as well. The sheriff's office assisted by sending out their own crews to process any evidence that may have been found. And at this point, Andrew tells the media that he heard an investigator say to him that when they first searched Barry's house, it smelled like chlorine, which definitely makes you think back to his room at the Holiday Inn. He also claimed that the CBI is investigating several items of evidence, including a towel, a tarp, and a blanket. And he also said that he thought it was very weird that investigators did not find any coolers in Barry's house because Barry was this big hunter. It's weird for him not to have any coolers. 
So where are his coolers? What else could they have been used for? So then in November of 2020, Suzanne's family had another blow. Her father died from cancer and he never found out what happened to his daughter. Around this time, the rumor that Barry could have been having an affair started to pop up again. Specifically, a woman named Morgan Gentile was accused of being his mistress and the reason he may have murdered his wife. Now, Morgan was actually working on the crew with Jeff Puckett, the worker who smelled the chlorine in the hotel room over Mother's Day. Morgan had also gone into the hotel room and she confirmed Jeff's story that it did in fact smell like chlorine in the room. And she said this wasn't just a hint of chlorine. I mean, her eyes were burning because it was so strong. She also said the towels on the floor were soaking wet and she couldn't make sense of the scene. And according to Morgan, Barry was acting very strange that weekend. On Friday and Saturday, she said that he was working a local job off County Road 105 in Salida. She said that Barry seemed stressed and was acting really strange. On Saturday around 11 a.m., he told her to go home early and that he had to go home and make his wife happy. He said that he was going to take Susan on a bike ride or a hike. But later on, Morgan heard that Barry had actually stayed in town the whole day and was out shopping alone. The job that was happening in Broomfield, which was building a retaining wall, had already been put off for weeks at this point. Barry and Morgan were supposed to be the only ones on the crew that day, but but last minute, Barry asked her to put together a full team. And Morgan also said that she talked to Barry on Mother's Day and that he seemed frantic. And this was way before he would have known that his wife had gone missing. So that stuck out to her. After she talked to him, Morgan picked up the other worker, Jeff, and they went to the hotel room and that's where they smelled the chlorine. And what was really weird to them as well is Barry said that he was gonna leave all the tools that they needed at the site to build the retaining wall. But when they got there, there were no tools. It seemed like he was very scattered. And then early on Monday morning, after he already knows his wife has gone missing, Barry takes the time to call them and let them know that there's gonna be a delivery of bricks. And they waited for it to come, but it didn't. And when it didn't come on Tuesday either, they eventually just went home. So then Morgan goes back to Salida. And when she gets there, two friends of Barry's come up to her and tell her, you know, you really don't need to give your phone number to the police. And they also made a comment about people thinking that her paycheck was hush hush money. Morgan thought that was weird. And of course she did give her phone number to the police and cooperated fully with them. And she was actually interviewed five times. However, she did refuse to take a polygraph test. Somehow Barry probably heard that she was working with police because he randomly decided to fire her over text. Then in an interview, he called Morgan a meth head and implied that anything that she said about him was false because she was just mad at him for firing her. Morgan said that the rumors about the affair, which have never been confirmed, have really hurt her family. She said that she had trouble finding work because of it and that her family ended up moving. She also said that she is afraid of Barry and hopes that she never sees him again. So there wasn't a lot of information coming out about this case for a few months there. And then finally, this past May, May 5th, 2021, days before the first anniversary of Suzanne's disappearance, Barry Morphew was arrested on the side of the road near his condo in Poncha Springs. To reach this point, over 70 investigators had worked on the case. They had served over 135 search warrants and interviewed over 400 people. And they claimed that they followed up on more than 1400 tips. It turns out that investigators had actually brought the case to the district attorney in April and laid out all the evidence for why they believe Barry Morphew killed Suzanne Morphew that weekend. According to people who were there, the presentation lasted hours and it seems like they have a very solid case against Barry. Still, we don't know everything. It is frustrating at this point. There's just a lot that's not being released, but it will come out. But Barry was officially charged with murder after deliberation, tampering with physical evidence, and attempting to influence a public servant. And Mallory and Macy were actually in the courtroom when their father was charged with murder of their mother. They cried during the hearing, and at one point, one of them held up a heart to Barry and pulled down her mask and said, I love you. I'm sure they are very confused and torn apart at this time. 
I feel so badly for them. Of course, we don't know if Barry is really guilty yet. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, of course. But a few weeks later, additional charges were added. This time it included tampering with a deceased human body, which they claim happened between May 9th and May 10th, 2020. He was also charged with possession of a dangerous weapon and with submitting a fraudulent vote in the 2020 presidential election. It turns out Barry actually cast a vote for Donald Trump for his wife, and he claims he had no idea that that was illegal to do. Now, court records in criminal cases are normally available to the public, but in this case, they're not being made available. The defense has actually requested that the court limit public access to the arrest warrant. And this they claim is to protect Susan and Barry's daughters and to protect Barry's right to a fair trial. Judge Patrick Murphy agreed to seal the warrant mainly to protect Mallory and Macy. And this has apparently been done to give them time to process what is going on and allow them to see the evidence for why they think their father murdered their mother in their own time and not just find out when everyone else finds out. So that definitely leads me to believe they've got something pretty solid. And I guess the decision to seal the records is also because the affidavit is really, really long. It's 130 pages and it's the longest and most detailed document that has come through the Colorado court system in over 30 years. So there is a lot we don't know right now. So basically they're saying that if the information was given up to the public, Barry would probably be deemed guilty by the general population way before the trial even started. Now, of course, people want the redacted version, which is where some important crucial information that needs to be made private is left out and they just release kind of the bare minimum. But the judge decided not to do a redacted version because it would be too time consuming. That's how long this thing is. Not only that, the prosecution and the defense would be able to go through it and redact what they want. So it would just take a really long time to get it done. So as of now, when I'm recording this, all of the records remain sealed and they definitely will be sealed till at least August, if not probably longer than that. People are very angry about this decision. The media has openly said they don't agree with this decision. And the media actually put in an appeal to the judge asking him to reverse this decision. And the media's argument is basically that it doesn't make sense to just make this decision based on the document being too long and it being too time consuming to go through it. They argue that this is just not a legitimate reason to take away the public's right to review public information. So I don't know what's gonna happen as of right now, Judge Murphy may reverse his decision or this could go all the way up to the Supreme Court. But if and when eventually this information is released, a lot of stuff is gonna come out about Barry and. I think everyone's gonna see this case in a whole new light. There's probably some major elements to this that we are missing. District Attorney Linda Stanley says that they are confident with the evidence that they have against Barry and doesn't expect there to be any more arrests in this case. For those that didn't hear the question, he said, we're not releasing the affidavit and we don't have a body, so how can I convince the public that we have a strong case? That's my job. I'm the one that considers how strong my case is before I bring charges and I wouldn't bring charges unless I was confident. So it sounds like they know that Barry did this. Um, it sounds like they knew for a while and they were just collecting a massive amount of evidence. Why would he kill his beautiful wife? They had this perfect life. Well, a lot of people believe that it could have been due to financial stress because Barry and Suzanne owned a couple properties back in Indiana. And when they moved to Colorado, one of those sales fell through. And so at one point they were paying two mortgages, which could cause stress. It's also possible maybe Barry had planned to cash in a life insurance policy on Suzanne, but it's only possible to do that if she is legally dead. Like I said earlier, there have been a lot of rumors about Barry cheating on Suzanne. Maybe he had a mistress. In February, 2021, he was photographed with a woman who had red hair. I'm not sure who that is. Morgan has denied having an affair with Barry and Barry also denies having an affair with her. So if he really was having an affair with another woman, maybe that could explain why he would want to kill his wife. Maybe he thought the divorce would be really messy and cost a lot of money and this would be easier. And if she was still alive, he would probably have to pay alimony. Then there's the possibility that Barry snapped 
on Suzanne, that maybe he could be violent with her. An anonymous person who worked for Barry for years claimed that he was the worst person he had ever worked for and that he had a terrible temper. He actually called him an extreme classic narcissist. Other former employees have talked about his temper as well and saying that he was very quick to anger all of the sudden. And then after Barry's arrest, Melinda Mormon, who is Suzanne's sister, called into Heart of the Rockies Radio, which is a local Colorado radio station to talk about the case. And she said that Suzanne and Barry's relationship had had deteriorated over the years and that she believed Suzanne was afraid of him. She said that she has proof, a text message that they're not sharing with the public at this point, but she said from this message, it was clear what her state of mind was. And she actually said that the text was very profound and very transparent. So after his arrest, Barry decided not to cooperate with police anymore. He refused to answer any questions. He asked for a lawyer immediately. And at this point, he has not yet entered a plea. We know that investigators have not found Suzanne's remains and that they cannot release a cause of death because they don't have her body. But they did say that they believe they know the details of the incident that led to her death. But that is pretty much all we know at this point. And it seems pretty obvious that Barry did this. Of course, innocent until proven guilty, there's always a possibility that he didn't. I would like to hear your thoughts, of course. Maybe you don't think he did it. I'd like to hear that. Any other theories that you may have? I remember this case first breaking on the news around Mother's Day and thinking how sad for someone to go missing on Mother's Day, you know? I just can't believe that now here we are a year later and it turns out her husband did it. But how many cases end up like that? I mean, it's so, so common. I am for sure gonna be staying up to date on this case and I will tweet anything that I hear. So if you wanna follow me on Twitter, that is below, it's Kendall Ray on YT. But that is gonna be it for me today, guys. And before I go, I'd like to thank today's sponsor and that is Casetify. Now I am a really big fan of Casetify phone cases. Casetify's cases are slim and protective. Their impact cases are engineered with a two layer construction of Chi Tech and they're drop test approved for drops up to 6.6 .6 feet and actually 9.8 feet for their ultra impact cases. Guys, these are so much more protective than cheaper alternatives that you may find at the store or on Amazon. And they're really cool cases. They come in a ton of designs. You can pick your favorite color, pick your favorite print and match your phone to your style. You can also add your name or a monogram for a truly custom case. And what's really cool about Case Device cases, and a lot of people I don't think know this, is they actually have a layer of antimicrobial coating on it. And that means these cases kill 99% of bacteria. So this thing, is pretty clean. Their impact and ultra impact cases are made with 50% recycled material. So I can feel good about my phone looking great and being protected. So if you guys wanna check out Casetify and get yourself a new phone case, you can head to casetify.com slash Kendall for 15% off. Also quick reminder, I do have a case request form in my description box. If you wanna see a specific case, you can submit it there. And I also have two podcasts, if you didn't know. I have Mile Higher Podcast, which I do with my husband every week. And then I have The Sesh, which I do with my cousin. And it's not true crime related, it's very personal and chill, laid back conversations that I'll show. So if you wanna get to know me more, maybe check that out. I will have both of those linked below. But that is gonna be it for me today, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you next week. Thank you.